I'm Bob Keiter, uh, director of the Wallace Stegner Center for Land Resources and the Environment. Uh, it's my pleasure to welcome everyone uh, to today's uh, Stegner Center uh, lunch uh, green bag presentation. Uh, we're very pleased to have you uh, join us uh, today. Uh, we regret uh, that we're only doing this uh, virtually uh, through Zoom uh, as a result of, uh, of course, the COVID pandemic that we all are living through these days. Uh, we do appreciate you joining us electronically. Uh, we hope to be back uh, in person uh, sometime before too much longer, but uh, stay tuned. Uh, hopefully that will come together uh, soon. Uh, because we are broadcasting uh, this uh, presentation from the university, we would like to acknowledge that this land, uh, which is named for the Ute tribe, is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and respects the enduring relationships that exist between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between the tribes, states, and the federal government, and we affirm the university's commitment to a partnership with Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. Uh, I would like before uh, introducing uh, today's uh, moderator uh, and the event, uh, just to call your attention to a couple future Stegner Center events. On March 11th, uh, over the noon hour as another Stegner Center green bag, uh, we will host uh, David Clark, uh, who's the former speaker of the house for the Utah House of Representatives. Uh, and uh, the author of the Lake Powell uh, Pipeline Act, uh, and uh, Zach uh, Renstrom, who's the general manager of the Washington County Water Conservancy District. Uh, they will speak uh, on uh, the topic of Utah's rights to Colorado River water and the Lake Powell Pipeline. Uh, for those of you who have joined us in the past, you may recall that we had a presentation uh, challenging uh, the need for the Lake Powell pipeline during the fall. Uh, we will hear the other side of that argument uh, with our March uh, 11th uh, presentation. Uh, I'd also like to call your attention to uh, the 26th annual Wallace Stegner Center Symposium uh, scheduled for March 25th and 26th uh, on the topic of the plastics uh, paradox, societal boom, boon or environmental bane. Uh, we'll uh, have a number of different speakers addressing uh, both the history, uh, science, and uh, role of plastics uh, in our uh, society, along with obviously uh, some of the economic and environmental implications. Today, we have the pleasure of addressing uh, the topic uh, of, uh, in broad sense, reimagining the Colorado River Basin. Uh, the presentation stems from a book uh, recently published entitled uh, Vision and Place, John Wesley Powell and Reimagining the Colorado River Basin. It was edited uh, by Jason Robeson, uh, Daniel McCool, and Thomas Minkley, uh, published recently by the University of California Press. I should note that the book uh, is available through the King's English uh, Bookstore, uh, the Stegner Center's uh, partner. Uh, for the 2021 20, uh, uh, season and our events. Uh, and I also uh, want to note uh, that uh, you have a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen, uh, and we'll be able to ask questions of uh, the panelists uh, as we move through the presentations uh, today. I believe we'll hold the, the questions until the end of all the presentations. Now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Professor Jason Robeson, uh, who's a professor of law at uh, the University of Wyoming College of Law uh, and works in the environment, uh, energy and natural resources program there. His writing revolves around water, public lands and Native Americans, particularly in the Western United States. Uh, as noted, he's the lead editor of Vision and Place. Uh, he is also the author of the Law of Water Rights and Resources, published this year by or last year by Thomson Reuters, 
and the editor, uh, and this is timely, of a forthcoming volume that commemorates the 1922 Colorado River Compact uh, Centennial. Uh, and that book is entitled Cornerstone, the Next Century of the Colorado River Compact. As editor of Vision in Place, Jason, uh, it's my pleasure to turn uh, the uh, program over to you now, uh, and we'll move forward uh, as, uh, as planned. Thank you for uh, joining us and presenting us with this opportunity. Many thanks for that introduction, Bob. Uh, greatly appreciate it. I'm gonna share my screen now for the introduction, but the book that I wanna focus on to transition isn't Vision in Place. It's Wallace Stegner's book, Beyond the 100th Meridian. One of the most important ever written about the American West and, and this connection, uh, which I think about while looking at the Wasatch Mountains next to me, which shaped Stegner's boyhood so indelibly, it, it all brings special meaning to Stegner, the Stegner Center's hosting of this panel. So it's a special place and I'm truly grateful for the introduction and for the Stegner Center's willingness to host the event. Another key aspect of the Stegner Center's hosting the event that is notable, of course, also involves the panelists here. Three longstanding University of Utah faculty members who authored or co-authored chapters for Vision in Place. You can take a look at the event webpage for their full bios, but briefly, um, Bob Adler is the former Dean of the S.J. Quinney College of Law here at the U, a university distinguished professor uh, and author of Restoring Colorado River Ecosystems, as well as two case books on water law and environmental law. Bob Kiter, again, thanks for the introduction, Bob, is the Wallace Stegner Professor of Law, uh, also a university distinguished professor and author of extensive public lands scholarship, including one of my personal favorites, To Conserve Unimpaired, The Evolution of the National Park Idea. Dan McCool, in turn, is Professor Emeritus in the University of Utah's Political Science Department, former director of the Environmental and Sustainability Program, among other affiliations at the U, and an author of a slew of books, including Native Waters and River Republic. Uh, what these authors contributed to Vision in Place cannot be overstated. We're truly fortunate to be with them all today. So thanks for being here, panelists, greatly appreciate it. I suppose in this vein that it's no surprise that the conversation we're about to have is going to track the book, Vision in Place, uh, released by University of California Press in fall of 2020. It's a book wrangled, wrestled into existence by three editors mentioned by Bob Kider a moment ago. Uh, Dan, here as a panelist, my colleague Tom Minkley at UW in Laramie, and myself. And it's a book uh, rooted in a broader sesquicentennial Colorado River Exploring Expedition. Yeah, get that acronym, SCREE, SCREE Project, led by Tom Minkley at University of Wyoming that retraced in summer 2019, the roughly 1000 mile route of the historic 1869 Powell Expedition. Uh, Vision and Place brought together a crew of 18 authors, eight visual artists, and two cartographers, 28 contributors in total to reflect on John Wesley Powell's vision of the Colorado River Basin and broader arid region upon the famous expedition's 150th anniversary. I had the privilege of serving as lead editor for the project. Um, like the panel itself, part of the book looks backward in time towards Powell's historical vision and the influence that vision has had or has not had since Powell's passing in 1902. But another part of the book looks forward in time and required contributors, including today's panelists, to grapple with the future, to think about and feel their way through what they would like to see the Colorado River Basin become as a place. Uh, we're gonna flow through the conversation today in exactly the same way over the next 45 minutes or so. Uh, as Bob Kiter mentioned, we've set aside time af after the panelists' remarks uh, for Q&A. Uh, please throw your questions in the chat. We are happy to engage with anyone who wishes to do so. Um, on that note, though, we will put in by talking about the American polymath who was John Wesley Powell and some of his wide-ranging ideas.
So we're going to start in the historical space. Um, and specifically, we're going to start with water. We're going to talk about water first, public land second, and native communities third. Uh, the basic question posed reflects uh, the content of this portion of vision in place. Uh, the content being aimed at gaining a sense of what was running through John Wesley Powell's mind when he was thinking about Euro-American settlement or colonization, depending on which word we wish to use, of the arid region, Colorado River Basin and more broadly. So the question posed, what was John Wesley Powell's vision for water, public lands, and Native Americans in the Colorado River Basin and broader arid region? And if I may, I'd like to hand it off to Bob Adler to talk about the subject in relation to water. Thanks very much, <clears throat> Jason. And I wanna add my thanks to Jason and Dan McCool and Tom Minkley for conceiving of this project, for organizing the project. It really led uh, to a fabulous book, which I would recommend to all of you. And let me begin um, by putting uh, John Wesley Powell's vision for water into historical context. Uh, the latter part of the 19th century brought this massive westward migration of Euro-American settlers who were disturbing and displacing native populations and economies with um, what we might call a Western European style agricultural and mining economy and urban economy. I'm sure Dan um, will comment more on the displacement um, of native populations. But from the perspective of water, <clears throat> the prevailing vision in the evolving society of this colonized West was to maximize water use for human settlement and development. And that happened according to the nascent but evolving prior appropriation doctrine of Western water law of first in time, first in right, and use it or lose it. So how did Powell's vision differ from that prevailing society, societal view? Well, in some ways, not at all. And in some ways, very much. So in what ways um, was Powell's vision not different from the prevailing society? Well, he was just as much of a water boomer um, as his contemporaries. And in fact, he urged reservoir construction, quote, until all of the streams of the arid region are wholly utilized so that no water runs to the sea. So we've got this contemporary romanticized notion of Powell of this proto-environmentalist. I would suggest that's exaggerated, but not entirely fictional. His contemporaries believed literally that rain would follow the plow that the climate would actually magically change to suit human development needs. He warned from a scientific perspective um, that um, that wasn't true, that water was limited in the arid region and that we needed to live within our limit, uh, limits. His vision was different from his contemporaries in that he would have achieved water development very, very differently. In his view, more scientifically, more equitably and more democratically. So, for, and Stegner um, uh, wrote about this as a blueprint for a dry land democracy. Mm -hmm. He wanted a democratic society. So at the macro scale, you can see this map, this wonderful Powell um, drawn map of the West mm -hmm. in which he advocated that geopolitical boundaries should be designed along watershed boundaries and not these straight survey lines that we have in the West. From a micro scale, he urged a West-wide system of small locally controlled irrigation and pasturage um, districts, which would shun massive federal control. The federal government would set up this system, but it would be controlled democratically by each local district. Water rights would be assigned by need rather than first in time, first in right. Water would run with the land, meaning that it would be tied as a matter of law to different parcels as a way of protecting settlers, as a way of protecting farmers and ranchers and other water users from potentially losing their water rights. It would be supplied 
by a series of smaller dams up in the headwaters of watersheds rather than huge dams further down in the watershed, which he thought would be more efficient. Now, I should say that his views shifted over time. Um, later, he became a proponent of larger dams in selected um, regions lower in the watershed. So that was his um, vision in a nutshell. What he mainly feared was the growing, what he thought was capitalist control of water, mm. of what is a public resource, and that these water monopolies would inhibit liberty, liberty and the Jeffersonian ideal of a society based on small farms. Um, that didn't materialize. I will close by noting, it is kind of ironic that Wall Street is now um, seeking to control water, <laughs> uh, to buy and sell water resources in the West, what Powell feared. Apparently time really is cyclical then. Oh, that was great. Uh, there's a certain falsity to what we're about to do in that so much of what Bob Adler just shared in regards to this watershed Commonwealth map uh, not only relates to Powell's ideas about water, water institutions, water laws, et cetera, but translates directly to public lands as well. Uh, the notion that Powell's thoughts on those two subjects were somehow compartmentalized is, uh, is, is misguided. They were totally interconnected. But uh, I'll make that observation by way of segue to our next speaker, Bob Kiter, to talk about this question, Powell's vision in regards to public lands. Thank you, Jason, uh, and thanks for the opportunity to uh, participate uh, today on this, uh, this panel. Um, I probably should start uh, by noting uh, that uh, during the latter part of the 19th century, uh, as has already been uh, suggested, uh, the West was essentially open for settlement. People were moving West, uh, but uh, much of the land uh, escape in the, in the basin and elsewhere in the West was still uh, in federal hands. Uh, the Native American inhabitants of the region, uh, unfortunately, having by then been uh, largely relegated to uh, reservations, uh, but uh, federal ownership was the uh, basic uh, uh, pattern uh, in the West uh, with uh, private ownership beginning to occur through the various federal disposal uh, policies. Uh, Powell was a man of his time. Uh, he was focused uh, on uh, promoting uh, Western settlement and development. Uh, and that meant uh, focusing principally on uh, four uh, resources. Uh, and, that, uh, and those resources were uh, principally for uh, development uh, and consumption. Uh, he was uh, concerned about uh, establishing a meaningful economy in the region. Uh, water, forests, uh, grass, and minerals uh, were uh, the focus of his utilitarian vision uh, for the region. I uh, should add uh, that uh, it did not uh, encompass uh, national parks, uh, which was subject of the chapter that I wrote uh, in the book, uh, or uh, even the idea of uh, preserving uh, lands. Uh, when he first, uh, 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 it was only shortly after his original expedition that the Yellowstone National Park was established as the first national park uh, in the nation. Um, Powell also, uh, as uh, Bob suggested, uh, had a great faith in science. Uh, he also had uh, faith in uh, the Western settlers and their character. Uh, he uh, understood uh, what uh, we today think of as uh, ecological uh, connections. You can see that in some of his writings. Uh, his uh, broader vision was uh, that there should be a limited uh, federal role uh, in uh, the development in, in, in the West, uh, ultimately, uh, that uh, much of the land uh, would end up in private ownership, uh, would be used for agricultural purposes. Uh, he was concerned that the national government was simply too distant uh, from the region to fully understand it. Uh, interestingly, though, uh, he suggested that there should be continued federal ownership of the forests uh, and uh, the grasslands, uh, although under uh, local management. Uh, he also, as Bob suggested, uh, looked at uh, watersheds as the appropriate uh, uh, governmental uh, entity uh, or using watersheds as the appropriate governmental entity to oversee uh, the region. Uh, 
little, little or nothing uh, in his writings uh, about, uh, again, uh, national parks, uh, wilderness areas, wildlife conservation, recreation, uh, not really a part of his uh, approach to uh, the West and the settlement uh, in the area. Uh, I, I couldn't help when I was uh, contemplating this chapter, but to think how Powell contrasted to his contemporary, uh, John Muir. Uh, they both they were born within four years of each other. Uh, they experienced the West during the same period of time. Uh, and uh, Muir's uh, vision was quite different than Powell's. Uh, Muir uh, was concerned about uh, protecting against the destruction of the region's natural beauty. He didn't trust uh, the locals, the settlers. Uh, and uh, as a result, uh, he very much uh, promoted the idea of national parks and uh, setting uh, aside uh, areas. Um, it, uh, uh, it, having uh, suggested that contrast, let me, uh, let me share with you a brief uh, passage from uh, the writings of uh, one of these uh, gentlemen uh, during that uh, period of time. Uh, the lofty peaks of the land are silvered with eternal rhyme. The slopes of the mountains and the great plateaus are covered with forest groves. The hills billow in beauty. The valleys are parks of delight. In the deep canyons, thrill with the music of laughing waters. Clouds rarely mask the skies, but come at times like hosts of winged beauty floating past. The soul must worship these glories. <laughs> John Muir? No. John Wesley Powell wrote those uh, words uh, to conclude uh, his uh, article uh, that appeared in 1890 in uh, the Century uh, Magazine on uh, institutions uh, for uh, arid uh, lands. Uh, and interestingly, uh, toward uh, the end of his life, uh, first uh, Powell uh, and uh, Muir uh, met uh, in 1893 when Muir invited Powell to uh, address uh, the second meeting of his uh, Sierra Club. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, interestingly, uh, Powell, uh, again, uh, later in his life, uh, actually endorsed uh, the idea of a Grand Canyon National Park, uh, fearing uh, potential ravages of cattle and sheep uh, in that uh, area. Uh, more about uh, Powell's evolution and the evolution of the public lands uh, when, we, uh, uh, when I reappear. Many thanks, Bob. I don't know if you alluded to another connection that's meaningful, and that is uh, Donald Worcester. Right. And I'm going to plug it there. Donald Worcester's work, the biographies of John Wesley Powell and Muir, uh, written by Worcester, are, are truly phenomenal. Great pieces of work. Highly recommend them. Uh, connecting the conversation, though, back to our map, um, although the water discussion and the public lands discussion um, make good sense of this map and Paul, Powell's conception of uh, organization of the arid region. Um, there are certain populations in certain communities that had lived in that arid region forever, for millennia. Choose the word you wish. You'll get different words depending upon whom you ask. What place were there? Uh, what places were there in Powell's Watershed Commonwealth's vision or broader vision for the arid region for the native inhabitants of Western North America? And on that topic, we'll turn to uh, none other than Dan McCool. Hi, Jason. Thank you for having me today. Uh, I, I co-authored the chapter in the book with my son who has a PhD in anthropology. And I think that's notable because uh, of all of Powell's writings, the huge volume of writing on land policy and water policy. Uh, he actually wrote more in ethnology and anthropology than all the other subject matter put together. So first and foremost, Powell thought of himself as an anthropologist and an ethnologist. Indeed, he started the Bureau of Ethnology. And what's, so amazing about that is that at that time when he first became ascendant and, and became famous, um, there, there were two 
contrasting schools of thought on how to deal with Native Americans. And we characterized these in our chapter as the assimilationist approach and the annihilationist approach. And let me spend a little time talking about both of these. Let's start with the annihilationist approach. Uh, that is not an exaggeration. Uh, there were a large number of people, especially political leaders and opinion leaders and newspaper editors out West that were entirely comfortable with the notion of exterminating every man, woman, and child in Native America. They advocated for that. They pushed for that. And they did a, a pretty good job of murdering vast numbers of Native Americans. Uh, when Anglo-Europeans first came to this continent, there was somewhere between five and 15 million Native people. Uh, by 1900, there was less than half a million. So it, this, this was extermination on a massive scale. And of course, everybody knows, or at least everybody should know about the well-known massacres at Sand Creek and Bear River uh, here in, well, it was you know, just across the border in uh, Idaho, but it was launched from what is now the University of Utah campus and Wounded Knee, but there were actually many, many massacres. And then uh, along comes a guy like, John Wesley Powell, who uh, was a staunch abolitionist. He signed up for the Union Army, didn't have to go. He, he, he could have, for, for a sum of money, you could opt out of the draft. Uh, he didn't do that. Uh, and, and he paid dearly at the Battle of Shiloh. He, he lost his, uh, his, much of his right arm uh, uh, due to combat there. Uh, so he was an, an idealist before he was all these other titles and all these other famous things that we know him for. And I think he transferred a lot of that idealism when he decided to come West and study the land and the water and Native Americans. Uh, the year before his voyage, famous voyage down the Colorado, the Green and Colorado rivers, uh, he came West to do research um, many of his contemporaries told him it was crazy that he'd be killed by Indians. He brought his wife with him and they camped along the White River in what is today uh, Western Colorado. And the normal relationship at that time when you uh, Indians showed up would, would be to start shooting. And instead he started talking and he met with them and he became friends with them, and he started developing the first uh, Ute dictionary. So his version of how to deal with Native Americans was way, way beyond the concept of most people at that time. So we really have to give him credit for that. And he believed that assimilation was the only way to save Native Americans, that if they did not become essentially facsimiles of white people, they'd be the exterminationists, the annihilationists would have their way and Native people would disappear. And, and he viewed Native people as something between a cultural curiosity to potential future citizens. So he was actually quite liberal at the time. Now, by today's standards, no doubt about it, uh, the guy was a racist. And we'll talk a little bit about that when we develop more of his uh, ideas and writings. So we have to give him credit for being what would be called a bleeding heart liberal uh, today in regards to Native Americans. And that idea that there was some value in native culture and there was value in preserving the lives of native people, even though he felt like uh, they needed to conform 
to uh, his concept and Western concepts of civilization uh, was actually well beyond its time. And that's reflected in his writings. His overt racism is also reflected in his writings. And he was never able to escape the, the racist philosophy of the day. So we can give him a lot of credit for being ahead of most of his contemporaries, being a leading voice for not murdering on a vast scale Native Americans. But he did so within a framework of racism that he just couldn't quite escape. Now within that, you, you think of a guy who is now sort of a cult icon to river runners. And I'm, I'm a river runner. I, I love rowing the big waters of the green and the Colorado River. Uh, that was audacious beyond belief. It, it was in the book, I think we, we call it sort of a, a crazy stunt. It's amazing that they survived that. So he deserves this role as sort of a cult hero to Native Americans, I mean, to river runners. And he deserves credit for starting the Bureau of Ethnology in his early work on uh, preserving uh, Native American language and culture, recognizing that he was a human being and he had his faults and among those faults is he could not escape the predominant racist philosophy of the day. And those conflicting thoughts and ideologies very much formed his writing and have really impacted uh, his impact on present and future uh, issues in the Colorado River Basin, which we'll talk about shortly. Thank you so much, Dan. Let's go in that direction now to synthesize in a way many of the things that Dan said and others. Powell certainly had a paradoxical relationship, a paradoxical perspective on the more than human world and on native peoples. Uh, that really does encapsulate it. Uh, I won't digress further. Moving forward, the next question that we wanted to address, uh, and we're going to <clears throat> flow through it in the same order, water, public lands, and the native communities, concerns trying to bring Powell up to the present. Powell died in 1902, the same year that the Reclamation Act was enacted, that the Reclamation Service was brought into being as an entity and water federalism in the United States was forever changed from that point forward, irrespective of your politics. It was forever changed. That's the year Powell died. Moving forward from that date up to 2021, where we sit now. Have Powell's ideas have tra had traction? <laughs> have they shaped things on the ground, either in how we think or the physical landscape? We're gonna explore uh, that line of thought now. Uh, and again, starting, if I may, with Bob Adler. Thanks again, Jason. Um, I want to address this um, how has Powell shaped the present issue? Again, by taking on one of the prevailing myths um, about Powell and his legacy to question it partially. So as I said earlier, uh, Powell had this vision of a utopian society organized in a democratic and egalitarian and scientifically driven way. So the myth is that, and you see this in many writings, uh, many commentators, is that Powell's vision was ignored and entirely lost. And had we only listened to him, we would have this great environmental paradise in the West. Um, my contention is that that is partially wrong in both directions. So in one direction, as I mentioned earlier, Powell's vision was just as oriented towards maximal water use as his contemporaries, um, he just would have done so in a different way. Now he did urge that we plan to live within those limits, but to use it entirely, use all the water that was available. 
So I am simply not convinced that if we had um, abided by all of Powell's tenets entirely, that we would live in an environmental paradise. On the other hand, um, as Western water law and policy evolved, we didn't ignore Powell's ideas entirely. Now, I'm not suggesting that anyone intentionally said, let's adopt what Powell wrote, but we did um, build many of Powell's ideas um, into our institutions and legal systems in various ways. So let me suggest three of those. One is that the prior appropriation doctrine did end up protecting farmers and ranchers. It didn't do so by binding water to the land as a matter of law, but it did so through the seniority system. Um, farmers were among the earliest users of water in the West. They have the senior most water rights and therefore they receive um, a certain amount of or a large degree of protection. Whether that's good or bad, of course, is debatable. Um, the good is that it protected farmers, it protected investments, it provided stability, but it also made water more difficult to move to newer uses, in particular in-stream uses for recreation, fish and wildlife as society's values changed. Second, we did end up developing a whole series of locally governed institutions to manage water. We didn't use the single model that Powell advocated, the top-down federal model, um, but we did end up with all sorts of water institutions that evolved in a slightly different fashion in different parts of the West. Mutual water companies, cooperative irrigation districts, cooperative water districts, all of which to some degree are democratically run. Now they haven't been entirely free of claims about monopolization and hoarding power. People who own water rights have voting rights in these districts. And there has been a lot of contentiousness about the degree to which they control water, but they were at least to some degree modeled on what Powell advocated. Third and most notable and what um, Jason mentioned earlier, the federal government most certainly did not stay out of the game. As Jason mentioned, um, Congress ended up passing the Reclamation Act in 1902, um, created the Bureau of Reclamation, which along with the Army Corps of Engineers um, and the Federal Power Authority and the Bonneville Power Authority created what is probably the largest system of big dams in the entire world. You can see um, the dam system that was built largely by the federal government in the Colorado River Basin. Again, there's some good and some bad there. Um, a lot of loss of local control, huge subsidies associated with the federal water projects, which led to massive inefficiencies in water use and massive environmental harm in the Colorado River Basin and elsewhere. Um, but it did help to resolve some serious interstate water disputes um, that might have been irresolvable, but for federal involvement, Colorado River Basin is one core an um, example of that. Uh, my guess is that if Powell came back today, um, he would be quite surprised about um, how Western water law and policy has evolved. Um, in some ways he would have been pleased um, and in some ways he would have been quite disturbed. Certainly a different conception of water federalism held by Powell. Uh, that subject federalism though, is certainly not just relevant in the water space. Uh, it is also a subject that uh, transfers directly over into the public land space. And what happened after Powell's death in 1902 in regards to the Colorado River Basin's public lands. Was Powell's very utilitarian vision uh, prevailing? Was it superimposed uh, wholly or partly on the Colorado River Basin's landscape? For uh, this train of thought, we'll circle back to Bob Kider. Uh, yes, uh, when uh, Powell, uh, <clears throat> he was living and dealing in an age of uh, uh, settlement and disposal of uh, lands uh, in the West, uh, and including uh, the Colorado River Basin. Toward the end of his life, uh, during the 1890s, 
uh, federal policy uh, began uh, to shift. Uh, and the most notable uh, shifts that occurred uh, there at the uh, around the turn of the century, before shortly before and at the turn of the century, the um, creation of uh, uh, federal uh, forest reserves that we now know as the uh, national forests uh, by legislation adopted by Congress in 1891 and 1897, uh, keeping those lands in federal ownership. Uh, other uh, laws that uh, showed up at the time reflecting a shift in federal policy included the Lacey Act, uh, which sought to protect uh, wildlife uh, in the West, uh, response to the buffalo slaughter and other such uh, incidents. Uh, the Antiquities Act is adopted in 1906. In 1916, the National Park Service is created. Uh, we're seeing a shift, a, a notable shift away from uh, disposal of these lands to uh, federal retention uh, and management of them. Uh, as uh, the, and, and obviously uh, the notion of preserving certain areas, uh, national parks in particular, uh, are, is creeping in along with uh, national uh, wildlife uh, refuges at the uh, turn of the century. Uh, this accelerates uh, uh, as we get uh, in post into the post uh, World War II era, the 1960s and 70s. Uh, we see federal policy moving uh, pretty significantly in a preservation direction uh, and environmental protection direction, uh, with the adoption of uh, the Wilderness Act, the uh, National Environmental Policy Act, Endangered Species Act, Clean Water Act, and the list uh, goes on. Uh, during that uh, intervening period, the four major federal land systems come into being, uh, overseen by the four principal federal land uh, agencies, Park Service, Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, and U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, so uh, a, a very notable evolution in federal policy uh, away from uh, simply a utilitarian vision of uh, the uh, public lands and what they were there for and good for. Um, in the uh, Colorado River Basin, uh, I think Powell would probably be surprised uh, by the mixed uh, land ownership pattern that we see today. Uh, there's actually more land uh, in the basin that's in federal ownership than uh, private uh, ownership. Uh, Powell, of course, uh, promoted the idea of uh, private uh, ownership. Uh, during his time, agriculture uh, reigned uh, uh, in the area, small towns uh, early on. Uh, today, uh, major cities in the uh, Colorado River Basin, some of the largest cities in uh, the fastest growing cities in the country, uh, and major population centers, uh, very different uh, landscape uh, than Powell uh, saw. Uh, and as a result of that, what, one of the things that we see today uh, is a, a whole series of national park uh, units uh, lining uh, the Colorado River, uh, as reflected in, this, in the green in this uh, map, uh, and uh, also units uh, elsewhere uh, in the uh, basin uh, disconnected from the river. Uh, add to that uh, national monuments. Uh, uh, refuges, wilderness areas, um, and you have a, a good deal of the area that uh, remains in a somewhat uh, natural uh, condition. Uh, again, quite different from the sort of settlement that Powell uh, uh, intended. Uh, the other uh, point I think that's uh, important to make is that uh, public land policy has evolved uh, during uh, this uh, 20th century. Uh, beginning uh, probably in the 1960s, roughly, uh, we see science uh, creeping into being a major uh, dimension of public land management, much more so than before in the National Park uh, Service, a shift away from scenic management to scientific uh, management. Ecology becomes a guiding principle, ultimately captured in the notion of ecosystem management that emerges toward the end of the system, or excuse me, the end of the century. Uh, 20th century. And uh, that in turn, I think is interesting to note, uh, picks up on uh, some of the uh, notions that Powell uh, brought forth uh, during his time. Uh, that is the interconnectedness uh, of uh, the natural world. Uh, nonetheless, uh, what we do end up with is a rather fragmented uh, ownership uh, through the basin. 
Uh, the natural setting is uh, disrupted, uh, certainly uh, by the dams uh, that you saw talked about uh, previously, all suggesting the need for more uh, coordinated uh, management. Uh, add to that the sheer number of people, uh, both living in the area and visiting in the area, uh, and the shifts uh, that that uh, has brought about in terms of uh, the economy uh, of the area, both in terms of uh, the smaller towns uh, and uh, the cities. Uh, in fact, today, uh, one of the major problems that the national parks, for example, face are how to deal with uh, the sheer volume and number of visitors uh, coming. I probably should uh, conclude uh, by noting in terms of a shift in economy today, in the Colorado River Basin, the national parks attract, or at least in 2017, attracted 35 million visitors uh, and added uh, $2.5 billion to the local economies uh, surrounding the parks and added 34,000 jobs, according to statistics. A rather significant shift in both the management of public lands and uh, the impact of public lands on uh, our life today. So a different economy, in many ways a different culture, and also different laws and policies came into being after Powell's passing <clears throat> in a similar vein. What about Powell's vision in regards to the native peoples? They didn't vanish. What did happen? And what bearing did Powell's ideas have after his death going forward to, again, 2021 today for native peoples in and around the basin? Dan, if you would. I don't think Powell opposed manifest destiny, which is a, it's a euphemistic phrase, sort of like the final solution. It, it's a nice way of describing something really objectionable. You try to put a patina of respectability on what was basically genocide and land theft. Um, but I think he wanted to do it in the most humane way possible. And part of the way he approached that was to write voluminously in ethnology and anthropology. And while that, that did a great deal to help preserve native culture and get people interested in native culture, his entire body of writing on in anthropology and ethnology was based on this totally discredited concept of unilinear evolution developed by Morgan and, and others that uh, my son knows that literature better than I do. Um, but it basically posited that civilization or human groups go through three, uh, stages, the stages theory, where they, they were savages. And then if they looked a little bit more like Western Europeans, they were barbarians. And if they looked exactly like Western Europeans, they were civilized. So if you're a Native American, your choices were to be labeled a savage or a barbarian. Uh, unfortunately, Powell swallowed that theory hook, line, and sinker, and it tainted everything he did. It tainted all of his writings. And today, he's a nobody in anthropology and ethnology. He's been completely discredited. And a lot of that started to happen even in his lifetime. Uh, his last major work was actually a huge tome in uh, anthropology. And even his contemporaries described it as gibberish. I mean, here's this brilliant polymath that's been thinking out of the box for 30 years in other fields. And he's got so many great ideas. And, and he writes a book that no one even during his time would bother to read because it was meaningless. And that's all been rejected. But he did contribute to this idea of well-meaning but misguided assimilation. And Native Americans, once we abandoned the 
annihilationist approach that really became public policy. And it formed the foundation of American Indian policy for a long time. And the only way Native Americans could escape from that assimilationist, which is really just a slow death by cultural asphyxiation. And the only way Native Americans could escape that was by empowering themselves. And that's a process that began after the turn of the century, uh, uh, 1900. And in 1924, the Indian citizenship made all Native Americans uh, citizens. Uh, the Indian Reorganization Act in the 30s as part of the New Deal made Native Americans uh, self-governing, they established tribal governments and the uh, Indian Self-Determination Education Act in 1974 uh, gave them a much greater degree of autonomy. Uh, while all of that legislation was happening, Native Americans realized that uh, as long as they let people like Powell and his, his assimilationist friends dictate policy, th they were going to be stuck in this trap of assimilation. And they began forming their own organizations and developing their own anthropology and their, their own political power. And they developed organizations like the American Indian Movement and later the um, Native American Rights Fund and the National Congress of American Indians. Today, there's, those are two very powerful groups and there's many of them. Uh, Native Americans could not vote in New Mexico and Arizona until 1948. And it required court cases, which, which both of those states lost. Both those states were still fighting, giving Native Americans the right to vote. And the, those cases were bought, brought by Native American veterans who went overseas to fight for democracy and to fight against uh, tyranny in other countries and then came home and couldn't vote. They didn't get the right to vote in Utah until 1957, 1957. And then in the 60s and the 70s, they started to organize. And during this time in the, the fields of cultural anthropology, people were developing uh, all kinds of new concepts that had nothing to do with Powell or unilinear, unilinear um, concepts of cultural stages. We, we write in, in, in our chapter uh, that that whole idea of unilinear evolution was swept out the idea scupper by the mid uh, 20th century, it, where, where it deserves to be. It's, it needs to be completely abandoned and it has been. So Powell, again, deserves credit and some criticism for uh, what he tried to accomplish. Uh, if you look at the preservation of culture through the lens of Native American reservations, which you see on the map there, that land base is the foundation, the heart and soul of Native cultural uh, preservation and sovereignty uh, today. And to a large extent, those reservations are, are a result of assimilationist policy. Now, those, those maps of reservations are a little bit misleading sometimes because of the Dawes Act. The Dawes Act, I believe was passed in 1889, I, if, I'm, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, most people assume that Powell uh, supported the Dawes Act. My research on, on Powell on that indicates to me that he did not, that he saw it for what it was, and, which was just a, an instrument of land theft, a, a way to take Indian land from reservations and uh, sell it or give it away uh, 
to Native American or, or to uh, Anglo people. Uh, Pow was a kind of a rock star of his day. If they'd had microphones in that day, Pow would have been the guy who was always jumping in front of the microphone. He was, that's the kind of guy he was. He, he was kind of a publicity hound, but he was completely silent on the Dawes Act while it was being uh, considered in con Congress. He realized that was really bad news for Native Americans. And today there are huge swaths of land in American Indian reservations that don't belong to Native Americans. It, those lands belong to Anglo people. And several of them, for example, the uh, URA and Uinta uh, Reservation of the Northern Utes in Utah, uh, the, the central part of it, the best land, the best watered land with the rivers uh, doesn't belong to you people. It's still within the exterior boundaries, but it uh, belongs to non-Indians. So Thanks, you, you can really see this mixed heritage of ideas and Indian policies uh, that, are, that grew out of Powell's uh, writings and thinking. Yeah. So we're now in the self-determination era of federal Indian policy. And as both Bob Adler and Bob Kiter described, uh, our water policy and our public lands policy uh, have morphed, have evolved considerably from what Powell had in mind, but that only brings up to the, us up to the present. And the heaviest lift I would suggest as editor for Vision in Place that was uh, uh, forced upon or shouldered by authors uh, in the volume didn't have to do necessarily with Powell's ideas, uh, either in their historical context or what became of them later in time, but had to do with the future. What should become of the Colorado River Basin as a place looking forward? And what individual authors uh, thought about that subject in regards to water, public lands and Native Americans, including whether any of Powell's ideas seemed like they had value or somehow aligned with the uh, different authors' perspectives uh, on the basin's future, the way in which the basin should evolve as a place. Um, for this forward-looking thread, we're gonna follow a slightly different order uh, by beginning with the public lands. So Bob Kiter, uh, if you would discuss the question presented in relation to the federal public lands, that would be much appreciated. Sure, thank you. Uh, in, in terms of thinking about the future uh, of the Colorado River Basin, Powell's ideas and roles, uh, role in it, uh, I think it's first important to note uh, some of the forces uh, that are uh, shaping uh, the future. Uh, climate change being one of them, uh, ongoing uh, scientific uh, insights uh, into uh, how to approach uh, natural resources management, uh, growing uh, region in terms of population, shifting economic realities, uh, and uh, changing uh, uh, cultural, social values, uh, all of which have been alluded to before, and uh, that will continue to be uh, the case. Uh, also, uh, in thinking about the public lands uh, in the area, mounting visitation, uh, that uh, seems uh, quite evident, both in terms of national parks, but elsewhere. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, I think uh, what we uh, are seeing is a much uh, greater degree of uh, Native American engagement in uh, public lands and natural resource uh, issues uh, broadly affecting uh, the basin. So uh, drawing from that, a few uh, quick thoughts. Uh, I think the, uh, we've seen a, a pretty strong preservation impulse arise across the basin, basin as reflected in both the establishment and expansion of parks monuments and the like, wilderness designations. Uh, likely that we will see more of that uh, sort of thing. Uh, slow, painful, uh, controversial uh, in all likelihood, but nonetheless, that seems to be uh, the general direction. Should add that uh, preservation, not only of the, the uh, region's uh, natural heritage, but also its cultural heritage as reflected in, for example, uh, the Bears Ears National Monument. Uh, proposal, which also is a reflective of much greater Native American involvement in uh, these uh, public land uh, issues. Uh, the second uh, uh, point I think worth noting 
is that uh, I, we are moving uh, pretty clearly, I think, in the direction of a larger, larger scale planning and management uh, on the public lands. So we're moving in that direction in fits and starts. Uh, many are characterizing it either as ecosystem-based management or landscape conservation uh, management. Uh, it seems to me that's likely to uh, uh, continue and expand. Uh, this is predicated upon basic ecological types of uh, uh, insights uh, drawn upon science, uh, and that in turn squares with uh, Powell's uh, early and original uh, ideas about how to go about um, uh, developing uh, and managing the resources uh, in the area. Uh, we already see examples of this sort of uh, uh, landscape or uh, watershed uh, planning with uh, the Colorado River flow uh, policies and planning that have gone into uh, uh, into our planning, uh, endemic species. Uh, there are other uh, opportunities uh, occurring uh, both formally and informally. Uh, this is essential to address the uh, ultimate impacts of climate change, also to ensure connectivity uh, between uh, different uh, protected areas there. Uh, the national parks, thirdly, national parks are going to have to begin to address uh, the question of uh, uh, the type of visitation uh, that uh, they're going to uh, uh, oversee and administer in the future. Uh, the role of the automobile in national parks. We're already seeing that with the shuttle bus system in Zion uh, and similar proposals uh, elsewhere. The um, uh, Speaking from a legal perspective, uh, the courts uh, uh, during the latter part of the 20th century and continuing now uh, are playing a role in public land management. Uh, that's likely to continue. Interestingly, uh, in his writings, Powell noted that uh, he envisioned the courts uh, playing a role in uh, over, overseeing uh, resource management uh, in his uh, uh, watershed commonwealths. Uh, probably the most important thing is that uh, uh, things have changed since Powell's time. Uh, he recognized that change was endemic uh, and uh, things will continue to change. At the end of the day, when it comes to uh, the public lands, uh, Congress uh, has the final say. Uh, as to the Colorado River Basin uh, public lands uh, and uh, national parks. Uh, it should uh, consider being prescriptive here, some sort of landscape scale planning uh, legislation to promote interagency and interjurisdictional coordination. It also would be uh, helpful if Congress thought seriously about uh, uh, ecological restoration opportunities uh, as uh, in order to restore some of the natural character where it's been disturbed uh, in the basin, along with, uh, as I've already suggested, the preservation impulse uh, is not going to go away, I don't think. And that's a good segue, I suppose, for the water space as well. Um, some of the, the progressive views, many of them involving federalism or implicating in federalism in various ways, also translate into uh, the water space. We have a bunch of questions along these lines in the q and I'm, I'm going to table those, as, as uh, mentioned at the outset of the panel, until later. Um, but uh, for the future of water, the living river system that is the Colorado River system, um, remarks by Bob Adler would be lovely. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Jason. <clears throat> and you're right, it is a good uh, segue. You won't be surprised based on my earlier remarks um, that I share much of Powell's vision for the future, but not all of it. Um, and you won't be surprised that much of what I'll say parallels what Bob Keiter um, just said um, in the water context rather than the land context. So first of all, um, we certainly can't accomplish Powell's vision in the ways he proposed. So the biggest example of not being able to turn back the clock, uh, there's no way we will redraw existing state boundaries along watershed lines. That ship has sailed. Uh, think what it would do to the electoral college and the political uh, uh, negotiations that that would uh, generate. Um, but we also have uh, you know, vested water rights. We've got working water law institutions. Um, it's not um, feasible and it's not smart. Um, to tear that all apart. But more fundamentally, um, because our values and priorities about water um, have changed in so many different respects. Um, we still value water for municipal water supply. 
We all turn on our taps and want to have water available for those purposes. We all eat the food um, that farms grow using irrigated agriculture and those uses and values aren't going to go away. But we also value water in the stream in a way that we didn't really recognize, appreciate, understand in the 19th century. We, we value it for environmental sustenance, for fish and wildlife habitat, for recreational uses, for aesthetic purposes, and so forth. So with those shifting values in mind, I have four proposals which are rooted partially in Powell's ideas. So the first is similar to Bob Kiter's notion of ecosystem management. And that's um, that although we can't um, rearrange the West geopolitically, we can manage river systems like the Colorado River much more comprehensively using the model of large scale watershed management programs. Plenty of examples around the country, uh, the Chesapeake Bay, the Great Lakes, the Everglades, in which we manage whole systems. Now the Colorado River Compact from a water law perspective manages the entire system within the boundaries of the United States. And we've got a treaty with Mexico um, to deal with the legal issues with Mexico. But otherwise we manage our ecological restoration programs and other watershed programs on a very fragmented scale. Um, we can change that. Um, and I think it would allow us to strike a better balance between human extractive uses and consumptive uses and the in-stream value of water for fish and wildlife, for public recreation and so forth. It would also allow us to take much better advantage of our incredible evolving uh, scientific understanding of how river systems operate um, and how aquatic ecosystems operate as systems. Um, and that includes um, climate change science, um, as Bob Kiter talked about. Um, it would also allow us, and this is my second suggestion, to be more inclusive and more egalitarian about how we manage the Colorado River. Um, the compact basically excluded the tribes. It had a provision saying, if we're going to give the tribes any water at some point in the future, here's a placeholder. Um, quite racistly and disparaging referred to as the wild Indian clause um, in the compact, even though the Supreme Court at the time had recognized federal reserved water rights for Native Americans, the Colorado River Compact did not. Um, we had a similar provision in the compact as a placeholder for Mexico, but it wasn't until a quarter century later that we negotiated a treaty with Mexico, giving them 1.5 million acres out of roughly 15 million acres in the river. In my view, hardly an equitable um, apportionment. Um, and we excluded environmental interests and recreational interests entirely. Um, a larger approach, a more collaborative um, approach could bring in those voices, those interests that have been absent in the past. Um, third, we can achieve a better balance between federal, state, and local control of water. Um, Powell advocated more local control, and the federal government seized a lot of control, and we've been fighting about it ever since. Um, some of these large watershed programs share power more collaboratively and more equitably than the current system for the Colorado. Um, and finally, um, we have to continue this um, now decades long process of not tearing apart Western water law. I just don't think that's politically fe feasible, um, but making it more flexible, moderating it and modifying it over time um, to increasingly recognize in-stream water rights, um, to make water more marketable in ways that can be used to protect the environment um, and so forth. So in some ways, Powell's ideas do have relevance to the four proposals laid out there by Bob Adler. I think that marks a major distinction with where we're about to go, circling back to Dan McCool. I don't wanna put words in Dan's mouth, but my guess is uh, Dan's ideas about the future approaches to native communities in the basin, what he would like to see in regards to the, the future of native communities in the basin, I'd be surprised if Powell has a place there, but I don't know, maybe Dan will 
surprise. So uh, what about the future of the Colorado River Basin in regards to native peoples, Dan? Your thoughts on that? First of all, uh, I think I, I'm less sanguine than Bob Adler about the efficacy and value of the law of the river today. I'm, I'm not sure if it's uh, uh, an acceptable framework or just an albatross because the Colorado River Basin is at a, a turning point. It's, there's a major crisis. It's, it's a train wreck about to happen because there's a very dramatic gap between supply and demand. And if growth is going to continue and growth has just been feverish for 40 years now, they're gonna to have to get the water someplace. Who are they gonna take the water from? Well, one option is taking it from farmers and, and that may happen. Um, we still grow a lot of crops in the basin that are um, basically surplus crops and we have to pay farmers not to produce so much. So it's fundamentally illogical. We grow a lot of hay. Uh, so we may uh, make quite a few farmers very wealthy or, or the uh, Wall Street firms who have purchased their farms and are gonna wait until the price goes up. But my fear, if the past is any guide, the other place they're gonna look is uh, the water rights of Native Americans. And I think that's a very real fear. At this turning point, there's two ways we, we might go. Uh, one way is to make the Native Americans the victim once again. And when push comes to shove, we, we take their water. And I think it's naive to think there's not a lot of people in Western state governments in, in the seven basin states that would happily do that. They, they, if they could solve their water problems by ripping off native people, that they would do that. But there's another option to that. And, and I hope our commitment to justice in, uh, and a different vision for the future is sufficient that we can take this option. And that is, to learn from Native Americans and start managing water more along uh, the kind of ethics and philosophy adopted by Native Americans. And, and, and we have uh, many examples of that. If, if you look at the emphasis today in, in both uh, land management and, and water policy on traditional ecological knowledge, there is so much there that Native Americans could uh, teach us about how to live within our means and how to live with the land and the water instead of simply exploiting land and water. We really need a, a new ethic of water. And the new ethic has to reflect this new reality of dramatic shortages of water and in the face of dramatically increasing demands. This ethic cannot look like the ethic of the last hundred years. That's just not gonna work anymore. The ethic of the last hundred years worked well when we could solve our problems with supply side solutions and build dams and pipelines. That doesn't work anymore. There's no more unallocated water there, there's no more water just free for the taking out there, un unless you take it from farmers or Native Americans. So the new ethic has to respond to that new reality. And Native Americans can teach us a great deal about how to formulate that new ethic. Uh, in another publication that Jason and I did, we, we uh, included something called the Bluff Principles, which was developed by a group of Native Americans in the Colorado River Basin. And if you read the Bluff Principles, they look nothing like the law of the river as it has been uh, practiced in the last hundred years. We really need uh, to learn from that. And the, uh, 
Let me just put in a, a plug for the chapters in the book by Autumn Bernhardt and Daniel and Amy Cordalis. Uh, they, they do a beautiful job of developing this alternative concept of how we relate to the land and water uh, in, the, in the basin. So th there's lots of ideas, plenty, plenty of grist for that mill in this book and in, in other forms. The other thing we have to do, and, and here I'm, I'm kind of channeling my, my co-author of my, of my chapter, uh, there's a huge role for anthropology in this. If you look at something like the Bears Ears National Monument, the, the real one, not the, the Trump fiasco one, uh, from wall to wall, boundary to boundary, it is chock full of archeological resources, priceless, irreplaceable. They have tremendous value as a form of cultural, cultural heritage. They, they attract tourists sometimes to their detriment. There's a tremendous role for archeology span and anthropology in working with Native American tribes to preserve that patrimony, that tremendous archeological resource and to preserve existing culture. And the way to do that is through the concept of a homeland, which again is a whole new concept, a whole new way of thinking about Indian reservations as homelands that are sovereign over their own land and water and, and culture. If we start, looking at the basin in a new light where equity and justice and, and, and both Bob Kider and Bob Adler mentioned these things. When we start being inclusive, collaborative, and we have a focus on equity and justice for everybody, not just white people, not just city people, but for everyone, that, that's a different dimension. And one that I, I hope we develop in the future. I think that will make the Colorado River Basin more manageable and more just for, for everybody. And there's a lot to learn from Native Americans in that. And that's a good segue for where we're about to go now. There's still 275 people on the participants screen. Hopefully even more will jump in. We've been going at it for over an hour, but I wanna keep the fire lit at least for a little while longer, as long as the Stegner Center will let me do so, um, I would be remiss not to have some Q&A. Uh, that sounds wrongheaded. Uh, please jump in there. There are almost two dozen questions in the Q&A. Type yours, uh, look at those that have been typed and give a thumbs up to the ones you'd like to see broached. I'm gonna rely on the thumbs up to determine which uh, questions most deserve airtime, but let's keep this thing going. So we'll translate to the Q&A. The first one is a water one. It's gotten like 15 thumbs up. Um, so let's let's go there. I'm gonna spin it a little bit. I'm gonna exercise moderator privilege and spin it a little bit. Um, I suppose Bob Adler, your two cents on this would be extremely valuable, but if others want to jump in, Dan uh, as well, feel free. Um, we have uh, in the Colorado River Basin now a period of time, a five year span where a new management framework is going to be negotiated for the Colorado River system. The 2007 interim guidelines, the 2019 drought contingency plans, minute 323 to the US-Mexico Treaty will expire between 2025 and 2026. The game is on. The Secretary of the Interior will be commencing, has commenced really, negotiations for a new management framework. And that negotiation process, make no mistake, might be analogized, at least in terms of the dynamics to treaty negotiations or the like. Many stakeholders with interests, many sovereigns with interests. Okay, that's my stage setting for the question. <clears throat> what would John Wesley Powell have to say about those negotiations and the future of the Colorado River system now, looking forward? What would he, what do you surmise he might say about how the negotiations should be structured, the decision-making process, or perhaps the decisions substantively actually reached? 
so I kind of feel like I'm in a seance that I need to try to channel John Wesley Powell and predict what he might um, say about that. Um, let me go back um, to what Dan said about the compact. Um, and, you know, I was speaking generally about Western water law. I wasn't speaking about the compact. Um, Jason will verify that I was a complete gadfly among um, water law scholars in writing 20, 25 years ago that we ought to revisit the compact um, and rewrite it because of all the things that it didn't take into account. You know, it didn't take into account tribal rights. It didn't take into account Mexico properly. It didn't take into account environmental and stream uses. It certainly didn't and, and couldn't have anticipated climate change, right? So I'll use that as kind of, uh, oh, and the chapter that I'm writing for Jason's forthcoming book um, advocates for environmental amendments to the compact to try to take that into account. So that's all a way of articulating that we have reached our limits in this basin. We reached our limits actually a couple of decades ago. It is going to get worse. Um, now the interim guidelines, um, the drought contingency plan have all done at least a reasonably good job of managing a broken system in a way that anticipates how we're going to operate the system as the water levels go down. Who's going to have to curtail their uses and to what degree? Um, and that I, I would actually say that was brilliantly negotiated because it was negotiated in a cold state before the crisis was upon us. And therefore the states could sit down rationally and figure out who was going to curtail to what degrees. Um, but as Jason said, that agreement is going to expire in five years. And what we need is a more long-term, more resilient and stable structure. Um, I would, you know, I know this is radical to many, but welcome to some, um, I would cut off all future withdrawals um, from the river. I just think that's foolish right now. Um, it's foolish to spend a lot of money on projects that are going to rely on uncertain water rights. Um, would Powell agree with that? I don't know. And the reason I don't know is that, um, as I said, he was kind of um, schizophrenic on the issue. He said, on the one hand, we should use every drop of water so none of it runs to the, the sea. And he might even have said so that none of it runs to Mexico. Um, on the other hand, he said, look, the weather's not gonna change on our behalf. In fact, it's turned out it's changed in the opposite um, direction. Um, and um, so, uh, you know, he would have said we have to do something to live within our limits right now. My answer is mixed bag. <laughs> I punted, I suppose. No, it's a great answer, it's a great answer. Um, no doubt Powell's perspective on aridity probably would factor into what he thinks should happen next. Uh, no doubt that uh, his appreciation for arid aridity would be maybe heightened based upon what the basin's hydrology has done over the past 20 years. Whether we characterize that as a mega drought or aridification or the new normal or whatnot, no doubt those realities, the finite nature of the resource would factor into what he had to say in the law and policy space. Dan, I see you raising your hand, but I think I have an even better question for you, unless you really want to jump in. Um, the question has to do with some confirmation hearings that are scheduled for next Tuesday back in Washington, DC. We face the prospect in our nation state of having the first Secretary of the Interior of Native descent, Deb Howland from New Mexico. Question posed in the chat, and again, I'm gonna paraphrase it or spin it a little bit. What implications do you see flowing from the prospect of having a Native Secretary of the Interior in your particular space, that is in regards to federal Indian policy. Bob, if you wanted to jump in, Bob Kider in relation to public lands or Bob Adler, if you wanted to jump in again in regards to tribal water rights, what might a native interior secretary do in those spaces that would be as historic as the office itself? First of all, uh, the appointment of Deb Halland as interior secretary has enormous symbolic meaning. And that's because 
the entire train of, of developmental law and concepts in the Colorado River Basin has been one of exclusion, of leaving Native Americans out. They were left out of the compact. They were left out of the many laws that were passed. They were left out when the water was allocated, left out of the organizations. They were even left out of the uh, supply and demand study done by the basin in, in 2012. That, that wasn't long ago. They're still being left out. All of a sudden, we have a Native American, assuming that the handful of Western uh, conservative legislators don't derail this, uh, who is going to insist that they be included. So uh, what's the connection between process and substance? Well, if you're left out of the process, it's going to have a pejorative impact on the substantive output. So leaving Native Americans out isn't an option with Deb Howell. She, she is not going to allow that. So I think it's actually quite profound that she will probably be the next Secretary of the Interior. And the new vision, and, I, and I'm glad to hear uh, Bob and I are actually uh, pretty much in agreement that we, we need a different approach. This new approach cannot leave out Native Americans the way it did in, in the past. And she's gonna help make sure that that doesn't happen in, in my view. Bob Kuyter, are you interested in jumping in in the public land space or should we? Uh, uh, just a couple quick points, uh, particularly in light of time. Uh, I, I think this is cons her uh, appointment uh, or nomination uh, is uh, consistent with what we've seen over oh, roughly the last 20 uh, plus years of greater uh, Native American engagement uh, in public land issues. Uh, it's reflected uh, most obviously and most locally uh, in the tribal uh, proposal um, for what to do with the uh, public lands uh, down in uh, southeastern uh, Utah. That is the initial proposal for the Bears Ears National Monument. Uh, but we also uh, have seen uh, uh, tribes involved with uh, uh, potential co-management arrangements, uh, both in the national park setting uh, and the national wildlife refuge setting. Uh, and I think it's fair to say we've seen a greater sensitivity, uh, far from perfect, uh, on the part of uh, the land management agencies in terms of uh, their relationships with their tribal neighbors. So uh, I would think that she would uh, promote that um, and that that uh, ultimately will uh, broaden uh, and make, uh, uh, as uh, Dan suggested, uh, more equitable uh, our approach to uh, public land uh, uh, policy. I'm mindful of the time, um, but there is one other question that circles back to the water space and it connects with the Stegner Center's programming later this spring, as well as its programming in the fall. And that is again, the Lake Powell pipeline. Um, the question posed is, uh, what might Powell's perspective on the Lake Powell pipeline be? Would you anticipate John Wesley Powell would be in favor of that infrastructure or opposed to it? Thoughts on that? And there is a native dimension to that question as well, Dan, uh, particularly in regards to the portion of the pipeline that would cross Paiute homelands. Are you asking me to start on that or Dan? Feel free. This will probably be our last question just because in the interest of time, um, but it touches on both of your expertise. Okay, so I guess um, I'll go out on a limb and say at this point he would oppose it um, because we've run out of water. You know, I don't think he would oppose that type of project inherently because he was in favor of developing water. Um, but I think um, when we've reached our limits, he would have said no. And that was a big part of his water philosophy. I do have to add that one thing about the earlier question, which is there's two ways to steal native water. One is not to give them the rights at all. 
The other is to give them the rights, but not give them the money to develop the projects. And we have spent billions and billions and billions on Anglo water products projects, very little on Native American water projects. Um, and there are large swaths of the Navajo Nation where people don't have running water in their homes. And so I think the new secretary might be able to do a substantial amount about that um, inequity. And can I say something in regard to the Lake Powell pipeline? Uh, perhaps Powell's most famous speech was the one where he talked about the heritage of conflict. And of course he was booed off the stage by the water developers and the promoters of pipelines of, of his day when he pointed that out. If you wanna create a heritage of conflict, support the Lake Powell pipeline because the other basin states have made it very clear, although collaboration has been the key to management for the last hundred years, if you try to build this pipeline, we're going to war. And the state legislature is now actually contemplating legislation, which I think is basically it, what they're doing is poking a lion in the, in the rear end with a stick. They're provoking that with the promotion of the Lake Powell pipeline. That, that's a great way to destroy the existing collaborative framework and provoke a dramatic new era. So the, the Lake Powell pipeline may be the straw that breaks the camel's back in this area. Well, like I said, that question was a nice one in terms of its bearing on the spring term Stegner Center programming as well as the fall term. Uh, on that note, in the interest of time, though we still have about 225 people on the participants list, I think we better uh, sign off. Um, in that vein, I want to say thanks so much to King's English for sponsoring the event, for being the bookseller for this event. They're located in the heart of Sugar House, known about that place since I was a kid. Um, very much appreciate the support uh, and the local nature of that business. Um, more importantly, or I guess more to the point as far as the panelists go, uh, greatly appreciate the time that you took out of your days to join for the program, as well as everyone who tuned in. Uh, great participation, really appreciate the engagement. Um, the last thing that I will note uh, dovetails with the panel itself, uh, and it's just an important closing note. Vision in place isn't a one-off deal. Uh, the 1922 Colorado River Compact Centennial is fast approaching, as has been mentioned, and Vision in Place will be followed by another book identified earlier, earlier that will mark this historic milestone, Cornerstone, the next century of the Colorado River Compact. Watch for it. Uh, for information about Cornerstone and the game-changing Colorado River developments going on right now surrounding the book, uh, please feel free to check out this podcast kindly put together by Emily Lewis, an adjunct prof at the SJ Quinney College of Law here at the U and an attorney at Clyde Snow. On that note, I'll just say more to come. And uh, if I can uh, close on behalf of the Stegner Center, uh, let me thank uh, Jason uh, for uh, organizing uh, this program today. Let me thank my fellow panelists. Uh, let me thank uh the technical folks uh, who brought this to you. Uh, and then finally, uh, since we uh, ended on a question about the Lake Powell pipeline, let me remind you that uh, on March 11th, uh, we will hear uh, the uh, presentation on Utah's rights to the Colorado River water and the Lake Powell pipeline. Uh, and then on March 25th and 26th, uh, we will uh, sponsor the uh, 26th Annual Wallace Stegner Center Symposium on uh, Plastics uh, Paradox, Societal Boon or Environmental Bane. Uh, with that, thank you again for joining us uh, and we'll see you in a couple of weeks. <laughs>